Hello and welcome to Back to the Science. I'm Dr. Susan Oliver and I'm a scientist and this is Cindy Oliver and she's a dog and sadly she's currently a dog with a very sore foot. She injured it but she is getting spoiled rotten and pushed around in a pram and so she is making the most of it and she's been very brave through the whole ordeal. Anyway, as a lot of you know, last week I had COVID and I would like to thank everyone who wished me well. I am now completely recovered. Of course, not everyone wished me well. Some continued with the usual meaningless insults, which is fair enough. They're entitled to show their stupidity. However, there was a question that a few people asked that I thought was worth answering, and that is, why did I get COVID if I'm vaccinated? People asking this question often seem to think that vaccines are meant to prevent infection. They're actually not. No vaccines prevent infection, but it can sometimes appear this way because they can often control infections before they cause disease. But whether or not they can do this, depends on the pathogen. So let's go back to the science and have a look at how vaccines actually work. So the reason vaccines are possible is because the body has an adaptive immune system. Now, the system is a lot more complex than what I'm going to go through, but these are the basics as they relate to viruses. The first component of adaptive immunity is antibodies. And this is probably the component you've heard the most about. Antibodies recognize specific proteins known as antigens on viruses and essentially grab onto them. This then prevents the virus from entering cells and replicating. The next component is memory B cells. These are essentially antibody-making factories that are ready to be switched on as soon as an antigen is detected again. The body also produces two types of T cells, which also play important roles in fighting infections. One type are known as CD8 cells, but have the more catchy name of cytotoxic or killer T cells. These cells recognise the specific antigens on the surface of cells that have been infected by the virus and proceed to essentially destroy the infected cell. This stops the virus spreading to more cells. The other type are known as CD4 cells or helper T cells, and these cells do just what their name suggests. Once they recognize an antigen, they start helping other components of the immune system to respond. Now, all of these components play a role in preventing serious disease. But in terms of preventing any symptomatic infection, antibodies play a greater role than the other components. And the reason for this is because the antibodies are already there, ready for action as soon as the virus enters the body, whereas the other components are activated once the antigen is recognised. Here's the thing, though. Antibodies naturally wane over time, and this happens regardless of the type of antigen that initially caused the antibody response and regardless of whether the antigen came from an infection or a vaccine. And there's a good reason for this. If it didn't happen, our blood would be as thick as pea soup from all the antibodies. And also it takes a lot of calories to build and maintain antibody levels. And the body rather annoyingly likes to conserve calories. But as this waning occurs, you will still be protected against serious disease from B cells and T cells but you'll be less protected against infection. The other thing to note is that viruses mutate over time. So antibodies formed in response to an antigen based on an earlier version of a virus won't be as effective on a mutated virus. It's important to know, however, that when you form antibodies to the spike protein or any other antigen, you don't just make 
one type of antibody. You form different antibodies to different parts of the antigen. And the parts of the antigen that antibodies are made for are known as epitopes. So although some epitopes may change, you will still have antibodies to the epitopes that haven't changed. So given the fact that all antibodies wane and all viruses mutate somewhat, why do some vaccines appear to prevent infection? The measles vaccine is often used as an example of this. But in fact, the measles vaccine doesn't prevent infection. People who are vaccinated against measles or previously infected with measles can be reinfected with the measles virus. But here's the thing. Measles has an incubation period of approximately 10 days until the onset of symptoms and about 14 days until the rash appears. Prior to the onset of symptoms, the virus is propagating internally. This means that if you have adaptive immunity from vaccination or previous infection, your immune system gets the time to clear the infection before you are symptomatic and before you are infectious. In contrast, SARS-CoV-2 has a shorter incubation period and replicates locally. This means if your antibodies have already waned, your B cells won't have time to make enough new ones to stop viral replication before you show symptoms. But for most people, your B cells and T cells will have time to stop the virus spreading further and will therefore prevent serious disease. And that's why people who are vaccinated are less likely to be hospitalised if they get COVID. And this has been shown in hundreds of studies. And this is just one example. In this study, they compared COVID-19 associated hospitalizations amongst vaccinated and unvaccinated adults in 13 US states between January 2021 and April 2022, which means they covered both Delta and Omicron periods. So this figure here shows the age-adjusted hospitalisation rate over time. In the early period, it's comparing the rates between the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. And as you can see, the rate is considerably lower amongst the vaccinated. In the later period, it's comparing those who are vaccinated with a booster dose, those who are just vaccinated with a primary series, and those who are unvaccinated. Again, the unvaccinated are considerably more likely to be hospitalised than the vaccinated. But those who are boosted are less likely, again, to be hospitalised. Importantly, the difference in levels of hospitalisation between vaccinated and unvaccinated and boosted and unboosted applies to all age groups, although obviously the absolute numbers are much greater for those over 65. And we see the same pattern when we look at COVID deaths by vaccination status. And the benefits of vaccination don't just relate to the acute phase of COVID. Vaccination also reduces post-COVID conditions. And I'll just show you a few studies demonstrating this. In this study, they measured the association between vaccination and acute myocardial infarction and ischemic stroke after COVID-19. And they were specifically looking at hospitalizations for these events between 31 and 120 days after COVID diagnosis. And they found that full vaccination against COVID-19 was associated with a reduced risk of acute myocardial infarction and ischemic stroke after COVID-19. For acute myocardial infarction, the reduction in risk was 52%. And for ischemic stroke, the reduction was 60%. Also, a reduction was seen across all subgroups, although some did not reach statistical significance. Another area where vaccines can reduce post-COVID events is autoimmune diseases. A number of studies have shown that diagnoses of autoimmune diseases are more prevalent after COVID. In this study, they looked at both the incidence of autoimmune diseases following COVID, as well as the effect of vaccination on the incidence. They identified a number of 
autoimmune conditions that were more likely to occur in people who had had COVID than people who hadn't. I won't read them all out to you, but the most common ones were other autoimmune arthritis, immune-mediated thrombocytopenia, Graves' disease, rheumatoid arthritis, and psoriasis. They then looked at the impact of vaccination on the incidence of autoimmune diseases following COVID. And they found that completion of two doses of COVID-19 significantly decreased the risk of pemphigoid, Graves' disease, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, immune-mediated thrombocytopenia, lupus, and other autoimmune arthritis. For other autoimmune diseases, there was a trend towards decreased risk with vaccination, but it wasn't statistically significant. Probably one of the most well-known consequences of COVID is long COVID. Now, the actual incidence of long COVID is a hotly contested topic. And that's in part because there is no agreed upon definition, but it definitely occurs in a proportion of people following COVID and its incidence is definitely reduced in those who are vaccinated. And I'll just show you one of the many studies that have shown this. So this is a study here and what they did was they compared post-COVID symptoms between those who were vaccinated and those who were unvaccinated when they were infected. But then they also looked at symptoms in those who had never been infected. And they did this because just because a symptom occurs after COVID, it doesn't actually mean that COVID was the cause because symptoms can, of course, have many causes. The most common symptoms occurring post-COVID were fatigue, headache, weakness of limbs, persistent muscle pain, and loss of concentration. For all symptoms, the incidence amongst those who had received two doses of vaccine was less than in those who were unvaccinated. And in this figure, the unvaccinated are the light blue bars and the vaccinated with two doses are the light purple bars. And at the time the study was undertaken, most people had only received a maximum of two doses. Importantly, this figure also shows the incidence of symptoms in those who haven't been infected. And these are shown in dark blue, which is sort of that colour there, but a bit, bit darker in the picture. Anyway, um, as you can see, the incidence of symptoms in those who have had two doses of vaccine is not significantly higher than in those who haven't been infected for any of the symptoms. So COVID vaccines generally won't prevent you from getting COVID over the long term. And anyone who understands basic immunology understands why. But they will greatly reduce your chances of getting severe COVID and post-COVID sequelae. But anti-vaxxers have an even more devastating insult. Yes, you guessed it. They suggest you get another booster. Of course, every time I hear this, I'm reduced to a blubbering mess because it's just so hurtful. But I'll be strong for this video. Okay, just breathe, Susan. <sighs> Sorry, guys, I'm going to have to take a break. I just can't go on at the moment. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm fine now. But I really wish my trolls would just stick to the misogyny and not hit me below the belt with booster insults. I mean, it's so confusing. Sydney gets annual vaccinations and no one insults her about it. And prior to COVID, lots of people got annual flu shots and no one batted an eyelid. But people don't seem to understand why some people require or desire COVID booster shops, shots. Now, depending on where you live, you may not even be eligible for the latest booster. For instance, in Australia, where it's summer at the moment, I wasn't eligible for the latest booster because I am under 65 and don't have any comorbidities. But my mother, who was in her 80s, was eligible and she happily received it because 
She's not scared of needles. And it makes sense for someone her age to get another vaccine because older people are more likely to suffer from what is known as immunosenescence, which means they are less able to develop long-term immunity. So they need the antibody boost from an extra vaccination to improve their protection. And we already know that the updated boosters are making a difference for people over 60. This study from the Netherlands, which is currently a preprint, looked at the vaccine effectiveness against COVID-19 hospitalisation and ICU admission in previously vaccinated adults over 60 years old. And it showed that vaccine effectiveness against hospitalisation was 70.7% and vaccine effectiveness against ICU admission was 73.3%. And this is effectiveness compared with not getting the booster, not effectiveness compared with being unvaccinated, which obviously would be much higher. And if you're not an asshole and care about others, you'd be happy to see these people get their booster. Now, obviously, if you're younger and don't have any comorbidities that increase your risk of severe COVID, you will already be largely protected against hospitalisation if you're vaccinated. But getting another booster will temporarily reduce your risk of getting COVID altogether and reduce the duration of your symptoms if you do get it. And for a lot of people, that's worthwhile, especially if you're not scared of needles. So in summary, if you understand basic immunology, you know that no vaccines protect against infection and whether or not they will prevent symptomatic disease over the long term depends on the behaviour of the pathogen and not on the actual vaccine. If you'd like to look further into the data I've presented, I've provided links in the video's description. And please remember this video is about the science, but you shouldn't take it as medical advice For that, you should speak to your medical practitioner. If you've got this far, thank you for listening. And if you've liked, shared or commented on the video, double thank you because that helps the algorithm and means that more people will see the video. And of course, thank you to everyone who has bought me a coffee and all poor little Cindy here a treat. We really appreciate your support. We will be continuing to make videos about the science in the future. So if you'd like to join the cool kids and stay informed, please hit the subscribe button. And this will be my last video for the year. And so for everyone who has watched my videos during the year, I'd really like to say thank you. I've really appreciated your support. I've enjoyed reading your comments through the year and also the people who comment on X Twitter, whatever. Thank you as well. And for those of you who do celebrate Christmas, I hope you have a wonderful day with your friends and family. If you don't celebrate Christmas, I still hope you have a wonderful day as well. I hope everyone has a great new year and I hope to see you back again next year. Thank you. Good girl.